Good morning. Welcome or welcome back to Bookie Monsters. My name is PK. Today is Friday, October the 18th. I'm completely lost on my days at the moment, but they tell me it's October 18th and it's Friday. We're here to look at the last of the new releases that have been published this week. We look at them starting on Monday, uh, each day of the week, Monday through Friday, a different genre every day of everything that has been set free this week in the world of books. Today is Reform Friday, and we're going to be looking at uh, some things that didn't fall under those categories and some nonfiction that caught my eye. Good morning, Kim. How are you doing? Did you have a good night? Are you having good nights at home? I bet. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I think so. I'm definitely going to work today. And... Uh, been taking meds. Um, it's lingering, but it's not like the headachey stuff from yesterday. So yes, had to do an assessment. Morning, Cajun. Morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you're feeling good. Thank you very much. Your op work again today. Oh, enjoy it. Fantastic. All right. So um, there were a couple Managed to sleep until 6.38. Ooh, that's about as late as I can sleep on weekends. Keo seems to think we need to be up by then. So <laughs> no matter what. <clears throat> so a couple of books that um, there's a site that I go to that has a, a good source of new releases. And uh, sometimes throughout the week, they, she, they add things that... Uh, after the day that we have a certain kind of book. And I know Mary likes the traditional looking romances. So there was one that was listed after Wednesday. This is As the Earl Likes by Darcy Burke, fourth in the Rogue Rules series. Heir to a dukedom, Clive Halifax, Earl of Shepherd, is weary of fixing his father's scandalous messes and watching his father, his mother, suffer for them. Chef vows to live as the Lothario everyone believes him to be, never to wed. Yeah, because that's going to help your mom. However, his parents will not stop insisting he marry, so he chooses the most inappropriate bride he can find and pays her to be his fake betrothed for the remainder of the season. Josephine Harker lives at the edge of society with a mother who runs a gaming club and an artist father who flits about the tomb. She just wants the ability to choose her own path instead of what society dictates or what her parents think is best for her. When Shepard, a notorious rake, proposes a faux engagement along with a substantial sum, she cannot refuse. Dangerously captivated by one another from the outset, their attraction explodes into a searing passion they, can, they can't deny. But the last thing Joe wants is to risk her heart on a rogue who can't see he's much more than his reputation or that there is such a thing as true love. And the other one that I had found that uh, we don't get a whole lot of is a Western. Billy the Kid, The War for Lincoln County by Ryan C. Coleman. Age 14, orphan. Age 15, inmate. Age 16, outlaw. Age 17, killer. In 1870s New Mexico, the ter territory is at a crossroads. The indigenous population is being driven out and driven down by the white settlers migrating west after the Civil War. The center of power isn't the governor, but rather the Santa Fe Ring, a group of wealthy politicians, businessmen, and landowners who exercise power through organized crime, theft, graft, and murder. Their main source of income is a mercantile store in Lincoln known as The House. After escaping jail, William Bonney, a.k.a. Billy the Kid, is a 17-year-old orphan who's been on the run for the better part of two years. All he wants is to belong, to find a place he can call home and people he can call family. And he just chose robbery and murder. That's okay. He'd have been better off alone. Billy falls in with a gang of ruthless rustlers and murderers who work as muscle for the house. But when Billy crosses one of the members, the gang sets out to kill him. Billy narrowly escapes, finding refuge under the tutelage of John Tunstall, an English immigrant new to the territory too, who has a sight set on opening a business in Lincoln, and he's intent on competing directly with the house. But when Tunstall is murdered, any positive effect the mentor had on Billy is eradicated, leaving the kid with only one thing on his mind, revenge. From orphan to outlaw to killer, this is the untold story behind the legend of Billy the Kid. Uh, fiction. 
All right. And then there was some nonfiction that caught my attention. Good morning, Mary. Happy Friday. Good to hear you might be feeling better. Yeah, it's progressing. Today marks five years since my car wreck that spiraled my health out of control. Oh, I'm so sorry. The market being on this side, you're still here. Mary, you are a goddess. Look, oh, <laughs> love Dukes and Earls. Thank you. Ah, oh, that searing passion. At least he had his shirt on. Kim says, thanks this year. Days fall the same. Yeah. Kim, a sad anniversary, but at least it's past and can work to get better. Indeed. A Western, wow. They are as scarce as hen's teeth. Indeed. That's why I thought I'd, I'd include it. Like, wow. All right. These are all nonfiction. I don't necessarily have to read the whole. This one caught my eye. It's Explorers, A New History. Norton Short, and by short, they mean short. Uh, this is by Matthew Lockwood. The impulse to seek out new worlds is universal to humanity, unfurling a tapestry of surprising and historically overlooked figures spanning 40 centuries and six continent, continents. Historian Matthew Locke narrates lives filled with imagination of wonder, curiosity, connection, and exchange. Familiar icons of exploration like Pocahontas, Columbus, Sacagawea, and Captain Cook find new company in the untold stories of people usually denied the title explorers, including immigrants, indigenous interpreters, local guides, and fugitive slaves. He highlights female foragers like Gudrid Far Traveler and Freydis Eriks Dolter, Viking women who sailed to North America in 1000 AD, and Mary Wortley Montague, whose pioneering travels to Constantinople would lead to the development of the world's first smallpox vaccine, etc. In only 176 pages. They weren't kidding that it is short. They get all this 40 centuries in 176 pages. Revisionaries, what we can learn from the lost, unfinished, and just plain bad work of great writers by Christopher Jansba. If you like to write, whether it's a pastime, a passion, or a profession, you've probably found yourself reading something brilliant and thinking, I could never do this. I might as well give up. But if there's one thing every great author has in common, it's this. They've all written some hot garbage. This book takes you on an engrossing tour through the discarded drafts, false starts, and abandoned projects of influential writers. In the process, he dismantles some of our most deadly, deeply held and most suffocating ideas about what it takes to produce great creative work. You'll learn that Franz Kafka lacked confidence. Octavia Butler had writer's block. F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote bad drafts. Ralph Ellison got overwhelmed, Louisa May Alcott got off to a bad start, and more deep, dark secrets about the authors you most admire. And a history, The Eagle and the Heart, The Tragedy of Richard II and Henry IV. Richard of Bordeaux and Henry of Bolingbroke, cousins born just three months apart, were 10 years old when Richard became king of England. They were 32 when Henry deposed him and became king in his place. Now the story behind one of the strangest and most faithful events in English history and the inspiration behind Shakespeare's most celebrated history plays is brought to vivid life by the acclaimed author of blah, blah, blah. Richard had birthright on his side and a profound belief in his own God-given majesty. But beyond that, he lacked all qualities of leadership. A narcissist who did not understand or accept the principles that underpinned his rule, he was neither a warrior defending his kingdom nor a lawgiver whose justice protected his people. Instead, he declared that his laws were in his own mouth and acted accordingly. He sought to define as treason any resistance to his will and recruited a private army loyal to himself rather than the realm, and he intended to destroy those who tried to restrain him. This was medieval times. This is what you had to do. I'm sorry can't look through today's glasses to the past like that. 
Henry was everything Richard was not, a leader who inspired both loyalty and friendship, a soldier and a chivalric hero, dutiful, responsible, principled. After years of tension and conflict, Richard banished him and seized his vast inheritance. Richard had been crowned a king, but he had become a tyrant. And as a tyrant, ruling by arbitrary real will rather than established law, he was deposed by his cousin Henry, the only possible candidate to take his place. Wow, that sounds familiar to a, a lot of things going on today. Two ways uh, of justice. Yeah. Stanley Tucci, what I ate in one year. Hi, Ms. Blogger. That writer's book does sound interesting. True. If you've watched his uh, show, you can see he eats his way through Italy, but this is what I ate in one year and related thoughts. Sharing food is one of the purest human acts. Food has always been an integral part of Stanley Tucci's life, from stracciatella soup served in the shadow of the Pantheon to marinara sauce cooked between scene rehearsals and costume fittings to homemade pizza eaten with his children before bedtime. Now, in what I ate in one year, Tucci records 12 months of eating in restaurants, kitchens, film sets, press junkets, at home and abroad with friends, with family, with strangers, and occasionally just by himself. Ranging from the mouthwateringly memorable to the comfortingly domestic and to the infuriating inedible, the meals memorialized in this diary are a prism for him to reflect on the ways his life and his family are constantly evolving. Through food, he marks and mourns the passing of time, the loss of loved ones, and steals himself for what is to come. Etc. I do like his show. I've not watched them all. Linguophile, A Life of Language Love by Julie Sedeby. Sedeby? Sedeby. If there is one feature that defines the human condition, it is language, written, spoken, signed, understood, and misunderstood, in all its infinite glory. In this ingenious lyrical exploration, the author draws on years of experience in the lab and a lifetime of linguistic love to bring the discoveries of linguistics home to the place language itself lives within the yearnings of the human heart and amid the social complex social bonds that it makes possible. It follows the path that language takes through human life from an infant's first attempts at sense making to the vulnerabilities and losses that accompanying accompany aging, etc. I thought that was also very interesting. <clears throat> And the last of the nonfictions that I pulled out to look at, Dorothy Parker in Hollywood by Gail Crowther. The glamorous extravagances and devastating lows of her time in Hollywood are revealed as never before in this fresh new biography of Dorothy Parker. From leaving New York City to work on numerous classic screenplays, such as the 1937 A Star is Born, to the devastation of alcoholism, a miscarriage, and her husband's suicide. Parker's involvement with anti-fascist and anti-racist groups, which led to her ultimate blacklisting and her early work in the civil rights movement that inspired her to leave her entire estate to the NAACP and are explored as never before, etc., etc. Okay, now we move on. I could eat my way through Italy. <laughs> Indeed, if you haven't watched his uh, show, uh, I watch it through Amazon Prime. Um, it's it's good. Hi, Miss Blogger. I'm just trying. <laughs> All right, let's go back to Cozy Mysteries. Now I can't remember. Did I which order did I do these in? Yeah, I think I did it in this order. Um, I think we were here. Did we do Murder at the Masquerade? I think we did. A Dead Giveaway by Joy Patrick. Part of the Magnolia Manor Mysteries, 10 books. In Sleepy Drifter's Cove, a fall town raffle to restore the old Starlight Lounge and theater brings an eclectic crowd and deadly consequences. 
Still haunted by a recent car bomb that killed a guest instead of her, amateur sleuth Lily Livingston tries to juggle managing busy Magnolia Manor with her role as a civilian FBI cold case consultant. Just as the inn's charming reputation has finally been established, an impossibly demanding elite guest arrives, as well as a mysterious job applicant who seems to have arisen from the grave. When a raffle attendee turns up dead, the cozy small town vibe goes south and indisputable evidence points exactly where Lily dreads it will. Refusing to believe her own eyes, she races against the clock to unravel both the local and FBI cases, finding herself entangled in a cryptic web far more sinister than she'd ever imagined, and her own life hanging in the balance. Bonnie writes the Beatles, Hamburg, book one by Cal Smog. Meet Bonnie Bell, an aspiring journalist on her first big adventure, a holiday in 1962 Hamburg with her father. father. But when they stumble into the infamous star club on the Reaper Bond, things take a wild turn. A brawl breaks out, her father gets arrested, and suddenly Bonnie's vacation turns into a high stakes mystery. Enter the Beatles, the house band who witness the chaos from up on stage and team up with Bonnie to clear her father's name. But as they dig deeper into Hamburg's underworld, they uncover a network of seedy crime lords and a string of daring heists that have the whole city on edge. Armed with wit, charm, and a little help from the Beatles, Bonnie must grow from a wide-eyed tourist into a savvy sleuth. But can this unlikely crew crack the case before the next big score, or will they be caught in the danger of the Reaper Bond's darkest secrets? Beatles are my all-time favorite group. I've read a lot about them and their time in Germany. That was the name of the rehab I was in, Magnolia Manor. Oh, there were no murders, hopefully. Wow, that's the second cozy series about the Beatles. I know, suddenly it's like... They had time to be involved in crime solving. <laughs> With their latest crime solved, PADA detectives Isla and Jace decide to dig into unsolved cold cases on the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle. When a famous paranormal folk singer, Alara Moon, disappeared without a trace a decade ago, the former Bermuda Triangle sheriff did everything he could to solve the case, but eventually the clues went cold. Now Isla, Jace, and Glow are ready to tackle the disappearance, but with nearly 10 years passing, can the dynamic trio really find out what happened to the famous siren? There are enough paranormal suspects, a jealous sea witch, a desperate pirate, a nasty shark shifter, just to name a few. Shark shifter. But when Isla and Jace are about to hit a wall, one of them becomes a target, proving it's not over until the missing siren sings. Keywords, Killers, and Kibble by Sky Sullivan. <clears throat> Book five in the Library Cat Magical Mysteries. The reclusive genius Winky Whisker is the creative force behind Kong's favorite brand of kibble. When he opens up his factory to the five lucky cats that find the silver tickets, Kong is determined to get one. But right away, Kong and Francie sense something dark hiding behind the factory's cheerful surface. There are grudges and rivalries going back decades, and when Winky Whisker is found dead, drowned in a vat of salmon gravy, Kong vows to avenge his death. Fancy can't resist a case, even if at eight months pregnant, all she wants to do is go home and rest. Rend Redclaw has the perfect wedding plan for the next full moon, but she's not sure the baby will wait that long, and neither will Hortensia. When people start to get sick in Hell's birth canal, she's convinced that one of the cursed books is responsible and the only doctor they have to help is the ghost of Dr. Moreau. I feel like, like I'm just reading words out. Nothing like that made sense other than the cats are solving the crime. So just me? Do I need more cold, cold meds? I haven't decided if I'm going to do anything today. Hey, it's Friday. It's Freeform Friday. If you like the Beatles, there is a podcast that is Paul talking about many of the songs and how he came up to write. It's very good. 
on life and letters. Oh, cool. Thank you. Dead Minds and Valentines by Heather Wiedner, fourth in the Jules Keen Glamping Mysteries. Fern Valley, nestled in the heart of the Blue Ridge Mountains, is ground zero for all things romance. The town has pulled out all the stops for the first Valentine's Day, Love is in the Air, book festival with events like Death by Chocolate, author speed dating, a character masquerade, and a male cover model fashion show. Everything is candy and roses until the sparks start to fly. Jules and Keen and her team at the Glamping Resort spend their time trying to tamp down fiery tempers because opposites may not always attract. When a popular author with a heart of gold is found murdered in the barn at the resort, Jules has to find the culprit before more than just hearts are broken. You know, you think the male cover model fashion show is going to be like real fashion model people? It won't be. It'll, it'll just be guys who show up. And you don't want to be the judge in that. Many years ago at uh, Virginia City, when I stage managed a show there, there was a bachelorette party at, at the bar because there's only really places like that to go to. And one of the actors was supposed to come do a strip show for us, but he backed out. He was afraid. So somebody went and got a biker from one of the bars. <laughs> And this gentleman was one of those very rotund kind of bikers and uh, enjoyed the performance a little too much, shall we say. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Mary, I have to pack my car for the show. Oh, you have a show. That's right. I don't like wrestling with tables, but once they are in, the rest is easy. Awesome. Where's this one at? Maybe you have better luck with this one. Christmas Carols and Canine Capers, exclamation point. Lucy Emblem is the author. In the heart of England's Malvern Hills, Tamson Kernick faces more holiday havoc when a festive gathering of inept but well-meaning carol singers ends in murder. While it's a silent night for the victim, the merry gentlemen and gentle women of the choir find themselves under intense scrutiny, etc., etc. We ran out of time, so we're just going to do a flash look at the rest of the books here. Murder at the Harmony Hollows Resort by Gina Kirkham. Going Ghost by Dina Marie. Fatal Ring by Safran Amati. Hot Goal Summer by Sabrina something or other. Can't see what the last name is. Uh, the Cursed Writer by Holly Hepburn. Rolled by Sarah something with an H. Uh, I'll Be Enchanted by Leanne Leeds. A Lime Flavored Crime by Rosie A. Point. A Cat Who Cracked a Cold Case by L.T. Shear. Dumplings and Disaster by Erica J. Walton. A Clean Murder by Diane Harmon. Mystery in Marseille by Nukur Tastin. And Muffin to Hide by P.D. Workman. So those are a whole bunch of the cozy mysteries that have been released this week. Here is... A link I've made this uh, Amazon list public. So if you want to go take a look at them, there are depths to you that we can only guess at. I'm not saying. <laughs> Maybe you're right. Uh, this show is close by. Oh, that's nice. And, and did it last year. So I know what to expect. Oh, very good. The Cursed Rider. I read the first one and it was good. Oh, cool. Okay, worth looking at. Sorry we didn't have time. Kim, have a great y'all. Indeed. You guys too. Hey, Storm. Pop it in the end to say hi. Hello. Have a good Friday, Storm. And boy says hi, Storm. Enjoy today, everyone, and have a great weekend. And hello, Storm. Indeed. Everybody have a very good Friday. Um, quick announcements. I don't have any sprints tonight. I don't do them on Friday nights. We will have them tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern and they will go for five hours. Have a very good day. If I don't see you, have a good weekend. Everybody, you're in my heart. Be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. Read good books. And as the banner says here, don't be a bookworm. Be a bookie monster. Om nom nom. Have a good day and God bless.